Okay, well, I don't know what page you're on your notes. What is it? Page something. Travel routes? What? 31. 31. Okay, page 31 in your notes. Okay, page 31. And we were just looking at different routes, and so uh, we looked at, uh, we finished up last time looking at the Via Maris, which is also known as the International Coastal Highway, commonly abbreviated as the ICH. Um, but I just had one, uh, you may not know that there's a very significant, in your Bible, very significant example of using the Via Maris, and that is in the story of Joseph, okay? It's the story of Joseph when Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, um, which kind of, he, this is funny, you just add up the miles on this trip. He, it's amazing. Um, so he, he, he's uh, in Hebron um, where they are staying uh, with his family uh, and then with uh, Jacob. And then he travels about 30 or 40 miles up north to Dothan, which is kind of pretty close to the Jezreel Valley. Um, up, not quite, but it's just north. He travels about 40 miles. And then he's sold there. Many times you think, and when I was growing up, I thought, oh, he went down south, right? That's where he, no, you know, he went up north. He goes up north, so up toward, he's basically in the middle of Samaria, is in later Samaria. And then he's sold, and he's sold into some Ishmaelite traders. Take him, and they travel about 250 to 280 miles um, uh, down into Egypt. So that's how far he had to go. Um, and, you know, if you were sold into slavery, you didn't get to ride in a car. You didn't even get to ride on a camel. You had to walk um, the whole way. Um, think about what he reflected on. I mean, talking about an opportunity to get bitter um, to what was happening here. God, I'm trying to follow you. God, I'm trying to do the right thing. And yet my brothers, you know, are doing this. Um, and yet, obviously, God used that time that he, because when he arrives there, we see consistently he what? He pursues God. He submits to God. He submits to God. He submits to God. He's submitting the Lord's will. So that actually was a wonderful time. Uh, when I was in a Bible school, they called it the BCH degree, backside of, backside of BCD, the backside of the desert degree, um, where God, many of the great men of God in the scriptures, they went through very difficult times. Moses went through that time, right? Joseph went through that time. Daniel went through that time. And yet, so he travels 250 miles down. And then we see what happens uh, over those years when he's down there. But he would have used the ICH. He would have used the Via Maris. He would have used uh, this highway. Um, he would have used this highway that went right along here and then goes up and it crosses over when you get north uh, up into uh, by Jezreel. Okay? Let's look at another um, highway. And this isn't as common a one. It's called the Way of the Patriarchs. Okay? It's, it's called the Way of the Patriarchs because in your Bible, um, when you look at the Patriarchs, who are the Patriarchs? It's basically the, the um, people in the men in the uh, book of Genesis. That's the patriarchs. And just kind of summarize it. So Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Joseph. It's called, this is called the way of the patriarchs because this is the way that Abraham, this is the way that Jake, uh, Jacob, this is the way that Israel um, and Isaac, they're going to travel on this road. It's a central road. This is an ancient north-south road traversing the land of Israel. It's right in the very middle um, of the, of the of the country. The name refers in the biblical narratives that it was frequently traveled by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right in the central part of the, the country. The way of the patriarchs follows the watershed ridge. Okay, we have a watershed. Uh, what do we call the watershed in the United States? Continental Divide. Okay, Continental Divide. If you've gone over, you say Continental Divide, go this way. You know, the water's going to go down, to, go over to the Pacific, go this way. The water's going to go to the Atlantic. So also, um, there was a watershed ridge going right down the, through Jerusalem, right in that area. If, you, if you're east of that, you're going to go to the Dead Sea and the Jordan Rift. If you're west of that, you can go to the Mediterranean. Well, this route travels right along there. Um, and it, it follows the watershed ridge line of the Samaritan and Judean Mountains. So it's right in the mountains, running south through Megiddo. So we're going from north to south on this one. Megiddo, Hatzor, Shechem, Bethel, Jerusalem, Ephrathah, and Hebron to Beersheba. Um, it's going it's to go right down through that area. This is a central um, route. Unlike the Via Maris and the King's Highway, which are international roads crossing the territories of many peoples, the way the Patriarch was wholly within the territory of ancient Israel, which means that this isn't the way ancient armies, when the Egyptians come through, we're going to look um, later on and see how in the, uh, the Via Maris and also went through Jezreel, um, Josiah gets, Josh gets killed on that road. But the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, they don't go through this route unless they're trying to take over Israel. It wasn't a common way um, to go. The ancient road, the Patriarch is now known, modern 
and Israel is what? Highway 60. You might not have been on it, but Highway 60 because where, did, where does modern, where do my, modern engineers put the roads? Generally, they put the roads in the same place they were before because this is the way it makes sense. Um, uh, it runs from north to south through Israel, passes through some of the most notable biblical sites, Shiloh, Bethel, Elon, Moreh, Jerusalem, and Hebron. This is just a picture. I'm kind of laying out you've seen this map before. But this is the, the direction. So the, the Via Maris is going to come up here, okay, uh, the International um, Coastal Highway. And, but then here's the uh, Way of the Patriarchs. It's going to come right up through through Hebron, go up through Jerusalem, and then it's going to go eventually connect to the Jezreel Valley and go across the Sea of Galilee. But, I mean, many of your biblical stories uh, will be found on this, the Way of the Patriarchs. Abraham, any of the stories you read, many of them uh, will be on this. Um, this is uh, just a little map of uh, 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 Jacob. You know, in Jacob, um, he leaves um, Beersheba, Beersheba um, where he's about to be killed by his loving brother Esau, and he runs. Well, where does he run? He has to run through. He's got. He's going to go north. He's not going to go east because then he hits the desert. He's going to go north. He's going to go to his mom's family, but he has to go on the way of the patriarchs. He's going to go right through the center of Israel, right up through that this central ridge route right here, Beersheba. Then he goes up through, um, it wasn't Jerusalem at the time, but Jebus. We'll look at that later. Goes through Bethel, and, can, and this Bethel, right in this area, is where he has that, that great dream of the angels coming up. And but the, my point is, you can see the central ridge route. That's where he's going. That's where he's going. He doesn't go through the Via Maris. He doesn't go, he doesn't go over east. He goes through, um, the, and then he's eventually going to connect and go up through and go around to uh, where his his uh, mother's parents were. Okay? King's Highway. If you have questions, I'm just going to keep, keep moving through this because it's not, not, I think it's not that exciting. It's just to give you um, a perspective. King's Highway. Okay? The King's Highway was different. Um, this is, a, this is on the, going to be on the east, east of the Jordan Rift. Okay? Via Maris is on the Mediterranean. Um, away the Patriarchs and be right through the middle of the country, right? But now we're going to go on the King's Highway, which is going to be on the other side of of the Jordan Rift, on the other side of the Jordan River. Um, uh, the King's Highway was a, a trade route of vital importance connecting Africa with Mesopotamia. I mean, very commonly, this is because they, they didn't want to go through Israel, and there wasn't a lot of uh, warring peoples in the center, so they could get through pretty easy. It ran from Egypt... It's going to go across the Sinai Peninsula, I'll show you that, to Aqaba, which is right on the, the Gulf of Aqaba, and then turn northward across Transjordan to Damascus and the Euphrates River. And then later on, um, in the 7th century AD, uh, after the Muslim conquest of the Fertile Crescent, now anything Muslim is going to be after the 7th or 8th century, right? Um, Islam did not exist prior to the 7th century AD. Okay, Christianity, 1st um, century uh, Judaism, in, in a way before that, um, uh, a thousand um, BC, but most Islam didn't start. It was a, it was a late, relatively speaking, a late um, religion. Uh, and it was, this is, this route was, if you were going on a pilgrimage um, for Muslims from Syria, Iraq, heading to the holy city of Mecca down in Saudi Arabia, you would have taken this route, okay? And so it was a very well populated route. We've already, look, I'm a mad map, but okay, there we go. So here, here's the, I think this is in your notes, I think, I'm not sure. So just to give you a real little review, here's, here's the, uh, uh, the way of the sea, the Via Mara. See, it's coming up here, uh, and then it's, it's right next to the Mediterranean. It's on the coastal plain. It's going to cross. Here's, the Je, here's that little thumb. The little thumb, you know, that's the Jezreel Valley, so it's going to cross the Jezreel Valley. Here's Megiddo. Um, we'll look at later what this whole valley of Megiddo is called, and it's going to go up here, and then it's going to eventually join to the, the King's Highway, which is east of the Dead Sea, east of the Jordan River. And uh, it's going to go through Edom. Uh, remember we looked at Petra, um, the Nabataeans? Uh, that, all of that was, I mean, not right on the King's Highway, but very closely connected to the King's Highway. You've heard of the, um, the um, spice route that would connect from the east, that would bring spices. I mean, we don't, I mean, you, you can go down to wherever your supermarket and get spices easy, but at that time, it, it was not easy, so it was extremely valuable. Some of it was almost as valuable as gold, and so this would have included that on the, the King's Highway, go up through here, go through Heshbon, 
uh, Rabbah, a modern-day Amman, Jordan, the capital of Jordan. It, that's going to be right on uh, the King's Highway, uh, very, um, very, very right to the east um, of, the, of the Dead Sea. Here's another map of it, a little king uh, pulled back a little bit. And once again, the orange is going to be the ICH or the Via Maris, you know, where they would go through here. Actually, the, this cuts over a little bit to Jerusalem because the Via Maris went up on the coast uh, and then crossed over to Jezreel Valley. But here's the King's Highway right here. So if you're coming to Egypt, it was very common to go across here. There was a trade route that you could do it. Um, go to Gulf of Aqaba. This is where you got the, that kind of that peace sign. It's up here um, on that. Uh, Aqaba, um, Solomon had trade routes there that went in Aqaba a lot, uh, that same area. But the King's Highway, they would come up through here and go through modern-day Amman, Jordan, and then go up through Damascus. Um, very likely, who came to Christ on the way to Damascus? Paul, Acts chapter 9, right? Well, what was he on? What road was he on? The King's Highway. That's what he on. He would have taken it, right? He wasn't just in the middle of nowhere. No, he was on the King's Highway. He would have used what was available um, at the time. And so that's, that's and it's going to go through Damascus, and then it's going to go north. Yeah. Is that also the route that Moses would have led them? Yeah, partly, okay? Partly. You know, Moses, they're going to go down deeper into the Sinai Peninsula because um, Mount Sinai is down south farther. Okay, he's going to go. Um, God did not want his people to go just the easy way, okay? Which is not anything unusual. Your life is not unique, right? And so God, God knew that his people needed to trust him. So they don't go across. They don't cut up here and go across. They go down deep into the Sinai Peninsula so they can uh, go to Mount Sinai because they're going to be at Mount Sinai for almost a year, getting the law, all that. They're going to be there, but then they're going to come up north, and almost certainly, at some point, they would have connected the King's Highway. Well, how do you know? Because this is where they, the second time around. The first time around, they go up to, uh, in Numbers chapter 13, they start to come up from the south, right? They come, Numbers 13, they're coming up from the south through Kadesh Barnea, and ten of the spies say no, two of the spies say, yeah, let's go, um, Caleb and Joshua, but they, they rebel, and then they wander around the wilderness, Wilderness, related to your question, Larry, they went around the wilderness, and we don't know exactly where they were. It's 40 years. We don't have all the stops in 40 years, right? It was a lot. He's got to kill off about 1,500 people a day. That's about what it took. He had to kill off about 1,500 people a day, so 2 million people get killed um, by the hand of God in that 40 years. But then eventually they what? They come up and they're going to, without a doubt, they would have come up the King's Highway because they're going to go through Edom, right? They have a problem with Edoms. We hit the Moabites, the Ammonites. We hit all those, right? And they would have come up the King's Highway and then they're going to cut off the King's Highway right here, right here in this area just north of the uh, Dead Sea. Uh, they would have been the plains right here, the plains of Moab, where uh, Moses is going to preach his final book. And what's the final book that Moses preaches? What? Deuteronomy, okay? Deuteronomy is just a bunch of sermons. He, it's, Deuteronomy means second law. He's re-preaching the law to them because all the pre first generation had died off, and so they need to have, be first generation hear the law of God. And you'll, you'll see the Ten Commandments repeated in there. You see a lot of the laws repeated in there. And so he preaches that right on the plains of Moab. So they had just come off, they had just come off the King's Highway. They would have been right there. But then uh, they don't go up the rest of the way. You know, No doubt um, the two tribes that stay over there, they would have used that to access some of that land. So that's the, I think I have another map of it as well. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is another map, a little more detail. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, then no doubt the children of as they come up, they would have come right up through here, and then they cut off um, to, to, to right here, um, just north of the, the Dead Sea, and they're, they're waiting in this area here while Moses preaches um, the uh, book of Deuteronomy, and then he goes up, uh, he goes up and sees um, the final time he gets to see the land, he can't go in, and God takes him. Um, doesn't specifically say God kills him, and God takes him, and um, yeah, he, 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 he dies, he goes, and then the children of Israel go across the land. But they would have come up, right, the King's Highway. They didn't come up through here, they would come, because a lot, you'll hear a lot of the names are, are people, are, are places along the, the King's Highway. Here's, uh, here's just another map uh, of it as well. Here's the Red Sea, Aqaba, Elat, right in here. Solomon has, uh, uh, going to have trading ships that go from Elat or Aqaba, uh, that goes from there, that has, he has a trading empire, um, which is very significant. So in other words, Solomon was able to connect 
connect all of this to the east through that trading port up through the king's highway then up into Israel. You see all the gold and all the things that he had, all the spices. It specifically talks about spices that he had. It all comes through that trading route. Um, Petra is on that route, um, Edom, uh, up through here, the, the king's highway. There was another highway, not nearly as heavily traveled, called the Desert Highway, which tells you something about it. Um, but the better one was directly, real closer, closer in. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions on that? King's Highway. Okay? Good. Uh, next one, Jezreel Valley, okay? What direction have all the ones that I've talked to you so far, what direction do all of these highways go? But north-south, okay? North-south. All of these highways go north-south. Why? Because in Israel, it's super hard to go east-west. Why is it very hard to go east-west? There's mountains. You got that central mountainous range right through there, which was in God's sovereignty very helpful for the Israelites. Why? Because it was, a, it was a, an area that you could defend very well because it was mountainous. The advantage was to the defenders. And that's why they tend to lose the stuff on the edges. They lose the Philistine, you know, the, all the, the plain, the coastal plain very quickly. If they're not walking with God, they're going to lose that stuff because... The, the Philistines have chariots and various things. But in that central area, that, that mountainous area, much easier to defend. But that meant that it, you don't just kind of go, go through there. There's, it's much more difficult. There's some very limited routes through there. The primary east-west route um, was the Jezreel Valley, okay? The primary east-west route was the Jezreel Valley. Let me just go to a map so we can know what we're talking about, okay? Remember the thumb? Okay, just put your hand up. There's the thumb. You know, right at the top of Israel, going up the coast, and there's that little thumb, okay? And the thumb is the key because the thumb um, connects you to the Jezreel Valley. Uh, Mount Carmel, where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, um, is going to be right. This, there's a mountainous range right here that protects it, and there's a pass called the Megiddo Pass, okay? And you've heard of the name Megiddo. Um, you've heard of a very famous battle that's going to be there. What is it? The battle of what? Armageddon. Armageddon. It's going to be at Megiddo. The, the, that va whole valley this is where it's going to be, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But here's Mount Carmel, and then this, this valley, maybe 10, 20, 10, between 10 and 20 miles wide, um, that is the, the best east-west route. So if you're coming up, you're, let's say you're coming up the uh, ICH, you're coming up the uh, Via Maris, you're coming up that direction, and now you, you, you get stopped by the, the Mount Carmel range that's right there. So you, got, you need to go east, and you're going to cut right through the Megiddo Pass. Actually, there are several passes. The main one was Megiddo, but you can cut through that pass, and you can go right across the Jezreel Valley. Um, which So this is going to be right here. This is going to be the primary east-west route. If you're coming up um, on the ICH or anyway, anyway, because you've avoided all these mountains that basically go from the whole of Israel. They're going to go for 50 or 60 miles from the Jezreel Valley down, way down to, to south. Okay? And so this is going to be the primary east-west route. Let's go backwards a little bit. Okay. Um, this valley, the Jezreel Valley, was a primary east-west route that saw a large amount of traffic. It was a site of many historic battles. And so if you read your Bible, you're going to see a lot of battles in the Jezreel Valley because it was a great place. I guess you'd call it like the Super Bowl of battles. I mean, this is where you can just, there's all kinds, there's a big playing field. And that's where you'd go. And and, uh, lots of battles. And, and also, it's very critical, why? because if you control the Jezreel Valley, if you, like you, if you control the city of Megiddo, if you control the Jezreel Valley, you control a major uh, hinge point of the country. And that's why, like, if you go to um, the city of Megiddo today, um, the tell there is very high. Why? Because that place has been destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt. Some of these places, 50 or 60 times, these places are destroyed. Destroyed. And when they destroy something, what do they do? They burn it, right? How do they know it's destroyed? They, it's called burn layers. They just, the archaeologists count the burn layers, okay? And sometimes they count backwards. Okay, that was, a children, that was when the, the Israelites did, or that's when, um, because it's been destroyed so many times. And so this whole Valley of Jezreel was really, really critical. Many historic battles, and there's going to be a major battle there. The battle of all battles is going to be in this location. The Via Maris, the way of the sea, passed through Megiddo and the Jezreel Valley until it reached Tiberias and the Sea of Galilee. See that right here? So you're coming up, you're coming up. I'm sorry, let me get my little uh, pointer. Wait a minute. 
I'm not going, sorry. There we go. There my pointer. Okay. So you're coming up. Uh, here's the plain of Sharon, the coastal plain. Here's Caesarea. You've heard of Caesarea, Book of Acts. Um, now that's a later name because what's, how do you know that's a later city? Caesar. It's named after Caesar. So it's not going to be there in the, in the early history. But it's, uh, so you're, you're going to turn uh, east and you're going to go across uh, through the, the Valley of Jezreel. Ultimately, um, you could go, you could, there's a, you could turn north here and go up through um, Sea of Galilee. Or you could just cut across the Jordan River here. So it was a very, very critical, critical pass until it reaches Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. Um, without a doubt, Christ would have traveled on this road as well. Any, anytime you read someone going from down south, let's say they're on the coast, and they end up north, they're going to have to go through almost certainly on the Jezreel Valley. Um, it's located at the southern end of the lower galley, bordered to the south by the Sumerian Highlands, the southeast by Mount Goboa. That's where Saul and Jonathan die. Um, remember? I mean, that's, that's why you have Saul. They, they, um, Jonathan and Saul, end of the book of 1 Samuel, when Saul and Jonathan, well, as multiple as sons were killed on that fateful day, um, it happens at the Jezreel Valley. I mean, all these things have a location, and that's what happened because this is a key place. Um, southern end, uh, and southeast by Mount Golgoa, the west by Mount Carmel, the country of Jordan, the country of Jordan um, to the, the far east. The valley's strategic location meant that throughout history, armies and travelers along the Via Maris would pass through the valley. Here it is again. This, this is another map. You can um, see uh, the inner, you know, we're coming up through here, and, and you would go through the Megiddo Pass, and then you, if you wanted to go north, you cut this way, or you could you could cut across and go ultimately um, to the Sea of Galilee to Tiberias. Um, very very common. Almost certainly, um, Christ would have would have been um, there. Sometimes it's helpful just think of an arrowhead because it kind of helps you because it opens up. It's kind of got a you go across the Megiddo Pass here, and then it opens up. It kind of looks like an arrow. arrow Head. There's another, if you, if you directly want to go directly east, you can go this way, um, across this, the Herod Valley route, this is, that's one place. Or if you want to go north, you can cut north up along uh, to the Sea of Galilee. John? There's kind of a three, go ahead. Maps. Where is Tiberius when you showed the Sea of Galilee in the Jezreel Valley? Up in this area, yeah, on the north side of it, it's gonna be up on the up by Capernaum, up by um, yeah, it's gonna be up on the northern part of that, yeah. His question was, where is Tiberius? It's up on the northern part, which is, once again, that's going to be a first century, Tiberius, is going to be a first century Roman place. But this is just kind of gives you a 3D view of the Jezreel Valley. Um, we're, looking, we're looking directly east, okay, just to kind of orient you here. Um, this is the Transjordan, okay? Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the uh, Jordan River. Way down here is the Dead Sea. If we kind of went that way, you would see the uh, Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem. But here's Megiddo. So the Megiddo Pass, you're coming up the Via Maris, you would cut across the Megiddo Pass, and then you can see this massive, it's just really flat, even today. I mean, it's, it's a, this is a, almost we would call like the Palouse of um, Israel in the north, because it, it, it is, it's tremendously fertile for farmlands, they're raising crops today, to this day. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful area for agriculture. I mean, it's, it's ma massive for that. But you can see it's just great open area. And you can see it does kind of look like an arrowhead, even from this um, angle. Um, here's the Megiddo in this area. Uh, here's the Mediterranean. It kind of opens up. This is the plain of like, if you went north here, you'd hit Tyre, you'd hit Sidon. Once again, here's that thumb. When I talked about the thumb, that's the thumb right there. That's the thumb. Uh, Mount Carmel, you know, the Carmel Mountains. Mount Carmel, Elijah challenging prophets of Baal. It's going to be right on that location. Okay, so it's a really, really um, key, critical um, location. And that's why there's a lot of battles on the east to west. Now, there's a very famous biblical story that happens here. Okay, um, King Josiah, who was a, a what would King Josiah? He's one of the kings of the southern kingdom. What would he be classified as? What kind of king was he? He was a good king, but he got killed really young. Um, 2 Kings 23, it says, In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, okay? Necho's down east, right? Ne he's in Egypt, right? And he wants to conquer, right? So he wants to go up to Assyria, right? Assyria's to the north. So where does he have to go through? 
He has to go through Israel. What's, what roads is he going to be traveling on? The Via Maris. How is he going to get across? He's going to have to go through the Jezreel Valley. So, so Pharaoh Necho is going north. He wants to conquer. Um, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a key power, uh, key power um, a force at that time. He, wants in, he went to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, which is way up north in Assyria. But modern day what? Iraq, modern day Iraq. That's where he's going. Hear that in the news a little bit. Um, and King Josiah went to meet him. When Pharaoh Necho saw him, he killed him. Him a ghetto. Now, one of the things, you read the bigger story, Pharaoh Necho says, don't, I, I don't care about you. Don't mess with me. Just stay up in your Judean highlands. I don't care. Just do your thing. He, his goal wasn't to conquer. His goal wasn't to conquer Israel at the time. And yet, Josiah's like, no, I don't want you going through my land. And, well, Pharaoh Necho was a much, much more powerful empire. And we don't, I don't sometimes I wonder in this story, but it was, God, he, there wasn't clear direction that God told him to do this. He just does it, and he gets killed. And then we go to some bad kings, very, very bad kings in the uh, southern kingdom at that time. So, but well, my whole point is, wh- where does he get, he get to him? He gets him because he knows. He cuts him off at Dresden. He knows he has to go through the Jezreel Valley. And that's where Necho, um, Pharaoh Necho kills him at Megiddo, um, Battle of Armageddon, in the Jezreel um, Valley. Um, Oh, uh, I think, yeah, I have it here. Uh, Revelation 16. And they gathered them together to the place. This is future, future, which in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. The word, English word Armageddon comes from the Hebrew, Harmageddon. Um, Mageddon is from what? Megiddo. That's what it's from. And then three verses later, and I saw the beast. Oh, who's the beast? Antichrist and the kings of the earth and their armies are assembled to make war against who? Christ, him who sat on the horse and, uh, uh, and against his army. Um, and so the, the, the battle of all battles will be at this very same location. Um, I, I, I bring that up to you to show this is a real place. This is a real place. This isn't some mythical, symbolic battle. This is a real place. This is, lots of battles have been fought here before, right? This is going to be at the valley of Jezreel, near Megiddo, Armageddon. Um, and we believe our theology, we believe that's still future. We believe that's at the end of the seven-year tribulation, that all the armies, you know, it's where yeah, the Christ at the beginning of the tribulation, he signs a peace treaty um, with Israel, uh, which even, I mean, look at, our, look at what's going on in our world today. And if someone, anyone, is able to actually make peace real in some kind of world peace, it's, it's something, right? No one's making peace. We're just trying to manage it. But who's the first person to make peace? It's going to be the Antichrist. Three and a half years later, though, he breaks the covenant with Israel because his plan all along is to destroy Israel. So three and a half years later, he breaks the covenant um, or the promise that he makes, uh, the, the peace treaty he makes with Israel. And then it all culminates in this, in the end of, your, at the, end of the book of Revelation, in uh, Revelation 19, when they're gathered together, they want to destroy Israel, right? Um, they want to destroy, by Israel, I don't mean Israel as a nation, I mean the Jewish people. And we know that at that time, God and his sovereignty will cause them to look at him whom they have pierced, and the Jews of that time will come to Christ. You look at Revelation 7 or Revelation 14, so he says 144,000. No, that's not Jehovah's Witnesses. That is, that is a reference to um, the Jews that will come to Christ. And they will know what tribes they're from. It says 12,000 from each tribe. And, but they'll be gathered together. They'll flee temporarily to in the wilderness, where Revelation 14 talks about, where they'll be kept safe. But then the Antichrist will still try to destroy them. And then all of it will culminate will culminate at this point in Revelation 19, when they're all gathered together. They're gathered together in, the, in, in this valley, and it's a real battle. And they're gathered together, but it's actually really not a battle, is it? Because what happens? Christ shows up and it's over, right? Yeah, it's very one-sided. It's a very, very, very one-sided battle. They're all gathered with all their whatever. You can have nuclear, you can have a jet, you can have whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, Christ shows up and he puts them down. It literally talks about by the sword of his mouth, by his very word, the power of his, his mouth, his speech, his power, and they are absolutely completely destroyed. The Antichrist is sent to the um, bottom of spent to hell and, uh, and the battle's over. But where does it happen? happens in a real place. It happens in the Valley of Jezreel. It happens right at Megiddo. And so that tells you, even that affects our interpretation of the book of Revelation. It's like, well, um, 
That's never happened, right? I mean, look at history. That has never happened. So either the Bible's wrong or something. No, it's going to literally happen. So we are still anticipating um, that. Okay, question. Question, okay? That's kind of the end of all the travel routes, okay? I'm going to look at water sources, critical issue um, in a moment. But before I do that, any questions about the different travel routes through the land of Israel? Larry. I just had a question on H-A-R. What uh, what does that Hebrew word mean? You know, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. We need my son-in-law, Kevin. He's the Hebrew scholar. If I have Hebrew questions, I ask him. Or you could ask, I guess, David or McGraw or someone. I honestly don't know. Good question. So the blood is up to the the horse's... Blood is up to the horse's bridle in Megiddo. That's a lot. Yeah, it says that the blood is up. Now, scholars have wrestled. What does it mean? The blood is up to the. Now, that's like not even gallons. That's like tankers more. I mean, some feel that it's because there's so much blood all over that the horses are splattering it up to that level. Yeah, it's it's a hard one to know. You know, is that what's the now? It does say that all. It's not just. It's all the armies of the world. That's what it specifically says. All the armies of the world. So there are, um, yeah, there are millions of people, uh, soldiers gathered at this place. Um, yeah, it, it, all we do know is it's, it's very significant. I mean, it's, it's massive. It's a blood bloodbath is a term we would use. It's a bloodbath. Um, no question about it. Good question. Any other questions on the, yeah, um, Andy. Go ahead. Google is the Hebrew scholar. Okay, Google is the Hebrew scholar. <laughs> what does har mean? Mountain or range of hills. Har means mountain or range of hills. Okay, har apparently means mountain or range of hills, which Megiddo is what? It's right, it's called the Megiddo Pass, which is right on that Carmel Mountain Pass. So that's it's probably reference to that. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Google, I guess. <laughs> Don't always trust Google. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Travel routes. So w- when you're reading your Bible and you see people going from here to there, ask the question, what travel route would they have probably gone? And just ask yourself the really simple question, how far was it? I mean, just that, that whole Joseph story, right? Helps you understand, oh, he had to walk 50 miles up the Dothan, and then he travels 250 to 280 miles south. Wow! That's a long time. You're not going to do that in three days. It was major. But just ask yourself the question, what route would they probably have taken? We don't always know, but what route from here to here? Well, I know. They're not going to cut across here. They're going to have to, like, if you want to go over to, to Babylon or, or Abraham, um, when he's going to come, he's going to have to go way up over the top. He's not going to cut across the desert um, when, he, when he comes from Ur. Okay? Good. Let's look at water sources. Okay? Water sources. Now, uh, this morning... All of you, every single one of us, without thinking, did what? You turned on the tap. Wow, water comes out. Um, now, it, we just take it for granted. That is absolutely, at this time, one would be unthinkable for them. It's, 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 it's not just water you can wash your hands with and wash yourself with. It's water you can what? You can drink. I mean, it's pure water. And so at this time, water was absolutely everything. Um, in your notes, you, I'm just going to, this is in your notes. Um, water was the chief consideration in everyday life in ancient Israel, right? This was the primary issue because water is survival okay you can live without you know shelter you can even you can a little while without food but you got three days basically without water um and it's critical 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 um issue and so they always were like where's the water look at the children of israel um what were the major issues if you look at the major issues as they're walking that 40 years of wandering what's the major issue water i mean we're, we're gonna die you have two, can you imagine if you're responsible, you are responsible for taking the whole city of Seattle, okay, through a desert. That's what you're responsible for. And finding enough water. Uh, one tap's not going to be enough. I mean, you got to have a lot of water. Like when it, even that picture, when it shows the, it wasn't just a little stream coming out of the rock that Moses um, struck. No, it was, had to be a gushing river to supply enough water for two million people. Water was the chief consideration uh, everyday life. Um, uh, rivers, lakes, wells. Um, it never needed to rain in Egypt or Mesopotamia. Why? Because in Egypt you have what? 
What river? Nile. We got the Nile River. They can they, they can access that for their for their um, uh, their crops, but also for their drinking water. There, there's a river there. Also in Mesopotamia, you have the Tigris and Euphrates. They're going to connect to like Ur and all Assyria and Babylonia. All of that. There's some there's some major rivers um, that are there. But in uh, but the land of Israel, Cana, um, depended on rainfall. I mean, it, it is a critical issue. Uh, dependent on um, rainfall. Here's just a, I don't know if I have this in your, um, I do, okay, great. Uh, this is in your notes. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of the, the rainfall, I think uh, uh, I think in the Spokane area, I think it's about 18 to 20 inches a year. I think, does somebody know any better? I think it's about that, roughly. We're, that's about what we, we get, about 18 to 20 inches um, of rain. Um, but then you can see in here, I mean, the gray is less than four inches. I mean, you're not going to survive. You can't grow crops um, on that. But then you can see some of the areas they're getting more than us. You can even see Jerusalem's a little bit on some transition here. Why? Because we're up in the highlands. We're up in the Judean highlands. We're just going to have more rain. And I'll talk about where would you have more rain typically. But this, this is what it's going to kind of look like. You can tell um, the further south you go, the less rain uh, you have. The further east you go, the less rain you have. The, the, um, the lower you go elevation-wise, the less rain you're going to have just kind of in a general um, way. But then God put them there for a reason. Uh, Leviticus 26 says, if you will observe my commandments, then I will give you rain in their season and the land shall yield its increase. So we've talked about inspiration, God's sovereignty. Guess what? You say, well, God, why would you put them there? Why don't you put them somewhere where there's just fresh water? Like, why don't you put them by the Spokane River? Why don't you put them by the Mississippi? Or why don't you put them by the Nile River? Why don't you let them stay in Egypt? Are you kidding? The Nile's right there. Why did, why did you call Abraham away from the Tigris and Euphrates River? Just leave him there. There's tons of water there. They would have been fine. No, God says, I'm going to put you where there is no water and like and not enough water that you are going to have to do what? Walk by faith in me, in obedience to me. And then you, you consistently you look throughout the Old Testament. It's like, you obey me, I'm going to bless you with rain. He's some very vivid examples. You know, Elijah prays. No rain. It doesn't rain. So God sovereignly is going to use this location. So God, God's in control of climate, right? God's in control of the rain right now that we're experiencing. And so also there, but God's blessing, particularly for them, was directly connected to the climate that he put them in and that they would experience his blessing if they walk by faith in him. He put them here for a reason. It was not an accident. Oh, man, what was, what was I thinking? I shouldn't have put them there. I should should have put them somewhere. No. Um, and we see time after time after time where they have a drought. And what does God do? God is using that drought to drive them to him, right? God does the same thing in our lives in different ways. He doesn't use the rain typically, unless if your basement floods and then he's used his sanctification opportunity. But other than that, uh, God uses other things in your life. That, this is one of the major things that he used in the children of Israel, the lack of water, the lack of water. So it was a very, very critical Critical issue. So it was a it was a spiritual issue. This issue of water, and throughout the scriptures, right? This word water throughout the scripture, this water is used as a vivid illustration. I mean, one of the classic stories um, is the story of the, uh, the Samaritan woman in uh, John chapter four. Remember, she's what? She's going to the she's going to the well. Now she's going in the middle of the day. No woman at that time would go in the middle of the day. You go in the morning because you're supposed to get the water. But she, because of her reputation, she would go in the middle of the day, and she goes to Jacob's well, which Jacob had dug. So it was a long time before that, right? It's a thousand years before that. So a thousand years before that, she goes to Jacob's well. And then they have this whole discussion about what? What does Christ tell her? He talks to her about living water. Now, living water was a unique term that referred to not a, a water out of a cistern, but it's living water that was, it was running, it was moving. But then he also says, if you drink of that living water, what? You'll never have to drink again. And she's like, oh, I want that. Why? She's thinking practically. They're talking on two different wavelengths, right? And he, he's thinking, you know, your heart, and because of your life, is demonstrating that you need a relationship with God, and I can give you that living water that you will never thirst again. He's not talking about physical water. He's talking about spiritual water. And she comes to Christ, right? It's a vivid example. And God uses, I mean, Christ uses her to even minister and a bunch of other Samaritans come to Christ. But what's at the center of that story? Water. 
Water, living water. Throughout the scriptures, this is used consistently um, to, to Christ will say, even though come on and drink of me from his innermost being shall flow what? Rivers of living water. Now, to us, that's like, oh, that's nice. I mean, at that time, it's a stunning statement to have the, that you would be a source of, of living water, that you could be a source, that you could, God could use you so other people can also access that living water. It's an amazing picture. So, once again, we have to put ourselves back in time and when we understand that the background, when we understand, you know, they didn't have access to water, so when Christ says this in John 4 to this woman, major, major significance, and also for you as well, that you can be a source of that um, living water, okay? Now, there's a couple places, and I want to I look at some, where would they get water, okay? They didn't get water out of a tap, okay? So, where did they get water? Well, where did they get water? Well, first place was well. What was well? Well, well, it's man-made. I mean, you got to do something to get a well. Some of you may have, you know, had to, on your property, you may have a well, not commonly in the city of Spokane, but if you're outlying some areas, you might be on a well. Well, they had wells. A hole or shaft dug through several layers of earth until it reaches a water table, okay? A water table, what's a water table? That's where, you know, it's flowed to the earth, but then it gets to a layer of impenetrable rock, and so the water pools. What is Spokane over? What are we living over? An aquifer, which is really one of the most significant things about the city of Spokane is we have, and that's a whole discussion, why in the world does our water cost so much? It shouldn't. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. We're not going to get into that because we are living on top of water. I mean, our, our neighbor, our, my neighbor, he's the head of the Whitworth Water District. And he says, yeah, he was, he was uh, his, his former job was, I think it was in New Mexico, and I mean, they were just had to conserve water. And he says, I can't believe it. He says, I'm squirting off my sidewalk with water. He says, because relatively speaking, he says, water is so amazingly free here. I mean, it's just not free. I mean, you pay for it, but he said, there's no reason we should be paying the money. Anyway, that's a whole different discussion. But um, wells, you had to dig a well. A holy shaft dug, man-made. We look at Abraham, and he's digging lots of wells, lots of wells, because they needed to find water. And how do they dig wells? They don't have a, you know, a rig that they back up, and they find the shaft, and they can go down, you know, 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, 700 feet, whatever. No, they're, they're digging it by hand, okay? And so it was a lot of work. And it's also very dangerous um, as well. So they're going to where that, they have water. It was retrieved. Um, they didn't have pumps, okay, in that time. Um, they would, you had to either, you dig down to the water level, and then you just got to have steps. So you got to dig the hole really big so you can have steps that go in this time. Many of the wells, they're deep, but you, they're just a series of steps. They're going to go around this big circle down to the bottom of the well that's been dug, and then you can access, you can get your water. Or um, Jacob's well, you could go there today if you went to um, Samaria or Shadrach come today. I'm going to be real careful because it's controlled. It's not controlled by the um, Israelite government. It's a very dangerous place. But Jacob's well, I mean, it's, it's a very, very, very deep well. And I don't, we don't know exactly how they dug it, but they got it. Um, and you'd have to, but you have to use a, a bucket um, to get that water. Because um, remember, what does the woman say to Christ in, in um, uh, John chapter 4? When he says, I'll give you water, what does she say to him? How are you going to get it? You can't get it. Um, and she, I mean, he's speaking to her in all kinds of confusing things. She's like, you don't have a bucket. You have nothing to get that with. Well, he's talking about living water. But because you ha that's one of the ways um, that you would uh, do that in a well. Here's a picture in Megiddo. Does anyone know where Megiddo is? Where's Megiddo? I just told you. Where is it? Jezreel Valley, right? And remember I said uh, Megiddo is a very famous place. Um, Here's some of the, the ruins of ancient Megiddo. It's right on that, in that Carmel range. Um, it's going to go right into the Jezreel Valley. And why was it very soon? They had access to what? Water. They had access to water. Well, there's a well, and you can see here. This is literally, and if you, you can see in the picture uh, right here, uh, there's no water right there. Okay? It's actually a long, long, long ways below that. Um, today, they've built steps. I mean, you're going to go 100, 100 feet down. I mean, they, they and the nice nice thing about much of Israel, it wasn't through like dirt and sand. You couldn't dig that. It would be through limestone, which you can get through with hand tools, and they would go all the way down to the, the water um, level. This is continuing to go down. The reason I show this picture, obviously they didn't have the stairs um, during 100 year What do you see here on the side? This is going to be where they would have the ancient steps, where they would have ways that you could walk down, down through this. This was, this was dug thousands of years ago um, in Megiddo um, to get down to the water level. Um, now, Megiddo was up kind of on a mountain, okay? Um, so, why, why would you 
have Megiddo on a mountain? I mean, not kind of, mountain, relatively speaking. Why don't you just go down to the valley where the water is? Defense. What? Defense. Defensible, okay? And that was the challenge. Um, you want to be on top of the hill, right? Because it's very defensible because any attacking forces are going to have to... So you build, your, you build on top of the hill, but the water is going to be at the bottom of the hill. So we're going to see that in Jerusalem. Um, Hezekiah has to address that issue that you're going to build for fortification on the top, but then you somehow have to get access to the water that's basically going to be down at the bottom because there is going to maybe be a spring that goes out very, very low. So that's what they're doing um, here. Uh, there's a very famous story related to water in the um, book of uh, uh, Second Samuel. It's a very sweet story, um, and it's just, it's in a, it's in a chapter 23, and uh, where uh, it's recounting David's mighty men. I love that section. If you haven't read that, I mean, yeah, we have special forces. These guys were the special ops of special ops. I mean, they they were amazing. I mean, amazing what these guys could do. But they were really very um, committed and very faithful to David. David, their commander. Um, one, why? He was a man of God. They knew that. These men knew that. And he's going to be the next king. But it's a very sweet story. And it talks about this. David's, uh, it says, David then was in the stronghold. Where's the stronghold? I told you this before. Probably Masada. Many scholars think that it might be, because that's the most, he's in that area of Engedi, um, but it's probably in Masada, while the garrison, the Philistines, was then in Bethlehem. Now, what's Bethlehem? What's David's connection to Bethlehem? What? House of bread. House of bread, but what is Bethlehem? It's his home. It's where he's born. It's the city of Bethlehem. That's where Joseph has to go, right? It's his, it's his home. But the Philistines, at this point, have control. So he's going to talk about something that he has known for years as a child growing up in Bethlehem, in this area of Bethlehem. Very familiar with what? The well of Bethlehem. The sweet water that came out of it. So David is in the stronghold, while the garrison of the Philistines was in Bethlehem. David had a craving. So he just said, oh man, oh, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Well, if it's by the gate, which means what? Well, it's right there in the middle of everything, and there's a fortress, and it, it's, it's not a great place to go get that bell, uh, a drink of water, right? You're not just going to run up to drink a fountain and get a drink, because the Philistines control it. Um, so, um, it's talking the context, mighty men. So the three, the three is a very key key statement in this time. The three means the top of the pile, first string, the three. Um, so the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. They took it and brought it to David. And I love this. And some of you read like, what? He didn't drink it? No, he didn't. Absolutely. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Why? He's like, I'm not going to drink something these men risked their lives for. Absolutely not. It's a very sweet story, but what I tell you that, it shows you the importance of water um, in this situation. Wonderful example um, of a, a well um, that was very, um, very um, significant. Water. Crucial, crucial issue. Um, yeah. Okay. Cisterns. Okay. We're kind of going, I guess, somewhat downward in order of what you want. Uh, definition. What's a cistern? Uh, a man, an artificial, man-made, underline the word, storage device. It's where you store water. I mean, they didn't have these big PVC tanks. You know, if you're, if you, you know, drive, you can see these, you know, on, uh, if you're driving down 990, you can see they're off of pines. There's just these massive tanks where you could store water. They didn't have any of that. Um, or if you drive up um, Thor Freya, you can see that massive, <clears throat> right there about, I don't know, 15th or 16th on the right-hand side, that massive concrete reservoir that holds tens of thousands of gallons of water, you know, everything like that. But it's man-made. Um, usually dug at the bottom of a hill. Why do you dig at the bottom of a hill? Because the water's going to run down to it. Because a part of the cistern, you're also going to develop all these channels, all these gutter systems throughout the whole area. Masada, I mentioned to you before, they had an incredible um, development that it, it drew water from the entire area around Masada so that it would flow into these cisterns, massive um, cisterns. Uh, then they would line it with plaster because, so that it would be sealed. It's like a, you know, like a swimming pool. I mean, they're going to line, although well, you wouldn't swim in it. Um, and it was filled by natural runoff um, of rainwater from higher elevation. 
usually it was underground to avoid evaporation. I mean, if you, if you did it above ground and it was exposed, well, what's going to happen? In the hot weather during the summer, it's just going to evaporate. And so you'd, they would dig it underground um, so the water's not going to um, evaporate. Um, surface pools or reservoirs served as collection points for rainwater, but then water from the surface pools was channeled to a cistern. Um, outside of Jerusalem, oh, about three miles outside of Jerusalem, kind of on the way to Bethlehem, there's what's called Solomon's Pools, where Solomon had a whole network of, of pools that were used um, to gather water, but then the, that was channeled then to Jerusalem, and even recently, I think in 2005, they discovered a massive cistern, it was underneath a playground, um, in Jerusalem that was used to store water in. I mean, very significant. So uh, a, a cistern. Uh, uh, and sometimes there is a very elaborate, I mean, a very elaborate system. There's a, a place, I think I mentioned it, called the Herodium. I don't know if you remember me talking about the Herodium, which is about um, seven miles north, uh, I'm sorry, southwest of Bethlehem. Um, Herod, it's kind of a mountain. Herod built it as a, one of his seven fortresses all over the place. But inside, it's really honeycombed. It's honeycombed with cisterns. Uh, tens of thousands of gallons of, of water could be stored in these massive cisterns all throughout um, this mountain where his for, underneath his um, fortress. Up on the top of Masada, I mean, on the top of Masada, and I'll show you a picture of it, there is some massive cisterns. Now, how did, it, how did the water get there? How do you get water to the top of Masada. Guess what? Someone carried it there. Okay, because now the whole top would travel, would go there, but there's not enough probably to fill it. Also, what was what else did Herod put at the very, very top? What did Herod put at the top? He put a swimming pool. Yes, there was a swimming pool. He was that rich. He had that many slaves, you know. Yeah. Uh, bad news. Today wants to go swimming. We got we to gotta get the water from the cistern up to the pool. Uh, so, yeah, water was very, very um, critical for them. Really key verse here. Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me. The fountain of, here's that key word again. Remember I mentioned you from John chapter 4, just a parallel issue. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Once again, we're using the illustration of water as a spiritual illustration, and, and God is saying, I'm the fountain of living water. And no doubt Christ is pointing back to this Jeremiah um, 2 issue when he talks to the woman in, in uh, Matthew in uh, John chapter 4 uh, that God is saying I'm the fountain of living waters because you have cisterns that are cracked because you have to keep plastering these cisterns right otherwise they, they leak out all the water and what happens to water that's been gathered in a cistern what it gets icky. It gets stale. I mean, I, I looked, I, I saw a picture of this. They had, they had uh, found this cistern underneath this playground, uh, and it's massive. I don't know, tens of thousands of gallons. It's massive. It's probably 25 feet high, probably 60 feet by 50 feet. It's big, um, and it's, it's got water in it. It's like three-quarters full. And there's a guy in there uh, with his scuba gear kind of trying. I'm like, oh, it's got all this moss and scum, and he's, they're checking it out, want to see what's in there. But, yeah, the water got kind of smelly. Now, you'll, you'll, you'll do it whatever you got to do if you're about to die, right? Um, you'll, you could boil the water, purify it. But God is saying, I'm a fountain of living water. I mean, every day, every day, every day, I'm going to supply you what you need. And you're going to broken cisterns. You're going to idolatry, right? You're going to false gods and following them. Come back to me, the fountain of living um, water. Very, 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 very um, key theme. Uh, here's, here's just some picture. I just have some pictures of a cistern. This, isn't a, this is a small, relatively small one. Um, this is in Jerusalem, a, a cistern that was found there. And they're finding them continually all the time. They're just, they're these massive um, cisterns. And they're, a lot of them are empty. Um, uh, this is in Masada. This is that cistern I was referring to you. This is on the uh, south, kind of the south edge of Masada. Um, and this is a stairway, just to kind of give you a scale. Um, this is a stairway. Because why? Because the, you can see the different levels. Here's the plaster. You see the plaster is kind of flaked off in here. And so this was, this was dug, you know, thousands of years ago. It was probably dug, probably dug at least, at least two, probably 3,000 years ago. Herod's going to be up there in about about 2,000 years ago, Herod the Great would have really reinforced this in about um, 30 BC, but it was even there before. He may have developed this, this term. 
Well, you can see, so why do you have a stairway? Because you've got to get, you know, as the water goes down, you've got to keep getting to the bottom. Um, this is really precarious walking along here. Thankfully, they put a rail on it. This is the same cistern looking the other way, exact same one. Just to scale, see the person down in the bottom right corner there? Um, that's how, it, and that, this isn't a big, well, it's a, it's a large cistern, but there's bigger, um, definitely bigger. So, I mean, can you imagine how much water? And this one also would have opportunities for water. It's going to be, you look at, you'll see these little channels that go from all the whole top of Masada that would go into um, this particular area. And, and Masada is honeycombed um, with many, 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 many um, of these um, cisterns, okay? Springs. This is, a, this is a key one. A continuous supply of fresh living water from the side of a hill. Use the result of water which is seeped down to a layer. So you're, you've got water that's seeped down to a layer. So the water's coming, you know, and it seeps down to a layer, but then it hits, it seeps down and it hits a layer of hard rock. And so they can't permeate that. So it's going to flow to the side. And so it's going to usually spring out the side of a hill at that time. And so it's going to be, it's going to continually run. It's going to continually run. Uh, it, then it flows laterally. That's what our aquifer is, right? The aquifer that we're sitting on, it flows, right? There's a flow to it. It's not stationary. The, the, the aquifer that um, Spokane is on. Um, uh, and then it escapes um, when it gets to that place. This is the most precious source of water. Why? Because it's fresh. It's not a cistern where it's icky. Um, it's even better than a well. Uh, it's, it's fresh. It's constantly running. It's constantly rejuvenating itself. Usually low on the hill, and I've already mentioned this to you, it's usually low on the hill, whereas the walls are high on the hill for defensibility. Therefore, one of the most difficult civic tasks in building a city was to figure out a way to hide and protect the spring, which is on the bottom of the hill in the case of a siege, and access the water from within the walls of the city, which is on the top of the hill. That's the big issue. Um, um, Jerusalem is probably a classic example of that. This, you've heard of the Gihon Spring uh, in Jerusalem. Remember, that's where, um, that's where Solomon is crowned. Solomon becomes crowned as the next king of Israel. Um, and David you know, passes the throne on to, to Solomon. Um, he's crowned. It's going to be at the Gihon Spring. It's a very key significant area. This is a relatively modern day um, picture of that. Um, but this is also an area, and this, is, this was slightly outside. Um, slightly outside. Um, when it comes where it comes out, it's slightly outside the walls of Israel, the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 30. It was Hezekiah who stopped the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all he did. This, once again, importance of water, right? So, um, Hezekiah, um, who is, what are the drumbeats that Hezekiah can hear um, uh, far away? Who is it? It's an acre of the Assyrians, okay? It's coming. I mean, you can see the smoke. It's coming. Uh, they're going to be destroyed. Um, Sennacherib, he's destroying all. He's Lachish. He's, he's just working his way um, through Israel. He's destroying, and he's, he's coming after. He's coming after Israel, and Hezekiah knows he's coming. And so he destroys all the outlying cities, um, but has, so Hezekiah has several years to prepare. And so what he does is he, well, I'll just show you a picture of it. It's commonly called Hezekiah's Tunnel, um, where here you have the Gihon spring here, and you can see what? It's, it's, gonna, it's, it's a difficult place. They want to take it, and they want to get it inside the walls. You heard the Siloam pool, where Christ does miracles, Christ does healings. The Siloam pool, that's New Testament. And so Hezekiah is going to dig a tunnel, uh, is going to dig a tunnel, and we'll look at this more in detail. I'll just kind of walk you through it when we uh, look in the city of Jerusalem. So he digs a tunnel. Um, there's also just kind of a highlight. Uh, you heard of, remember um, Joab um, climbs through what's commonly called Warren's Shaft. Um, it wasn't called that at that time. It's about the English guy that discovered it. But he climbs up through it and conquers Jebus, um, which will later become Jerusalem. But the key thing was Hezekiah brings the water, and it's this long tunnel. You can walk through it today. Um, when we go to Israel, We'll walk through it. Um if you're not claustrophobic. Um, but, uh, but because water's still running through, you walk through water eh, almost up to your waist at some points uh, in time. But critical issue, water. He brought water. Okay? Question about water. Yeah, Mike. Well, where does Jerusalem get its water now? Um, Jerusalem is much larger population-wise, and so they're going to... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that could be a whole study. Um, that's why um, the um, 
the nation of Israel is definitely on the cutting edge of water, even desalinization. I mean, there's not enough, obviously, from the Gihon Spring. They're going to have, one, they're going to have wells, but they have a lots of other things that they're going to, to do. They're going to do desalinization is a big issue, um, which I'm sure you know that they actually provide all the water for the Gaza Strip. I mean, the Israelis provide the water for the um, all the Palestinians there. If they said, oh, we're not doing that anymore, they would all literally die. And so they're providing the water for the very people um, that are attacking and the food. Um, so it's a lot of different ways. It's not enough just for, for this because there's a lot more people. A lot more people in Jerusalem than would live there at that time. Good. Any other questions? Water. Yeah, Dick. Last week we read about a source of water of uh, the Jew of Mount Hermon oh. on, the, on the hills of Jerusalem. Yeah. So that would be another source for. Yeah, another source. And, and yeah, and Dick's referring to the, the dew, and I'm going to look at that when we look at climate, because that is an issue. There's a, 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 and it relates to the Mediterranean as well, that there's enough dew and, um, and uh, winds that will allow um, certain crops like olives and grapes to, to, to do fairly well, even from just that, yeah, the dew, um, or Matt Herman, yeah. Let's look at climate. I'm going to this really quick. We're going to introduce this. Um, uh, yeah, we're not going to get to Jerusalem. We'll get there next week. Uh, the climate of Israel is remarkably similar to that of Southern California. I grew up in Southern California, and it's very, very similar um, to that. Uh, because of a similar latitude, Israel lies between the desert and uh, the sea and the Mediterranean. That's what, I mean, Los Angeles, California, that whole central area, there's a desert. There's a desert directly to the east of a lot of California, and then you have the ocean. Very similar um, uh, climate. Um, here you have just a picture, I don't know if you have this in your notes, but this just gives you an, an idea. Um, you see the dark green is um, Mediterranean, it's woodland, shrublands, Jerusalem is particularly on that. The coastal plain um, right here, shrub steps, which is kind of a, in the, in not as much water. And you'll see this very parallel as the waterfall. If you overlaid this over the other map that I had, you can see it directly overlaps, you know, what it's going to be like. Uh, and then you have the desert, extreme deserts. Um, down in here where there's virtually, you know, zero to three inches of rain a year. It's um, not um, survivable. Summer, there is from May to September, uh, very, very similar to our, um, as far as time frame, not similar to our climate, but similar to our time frame. May to September, it's very stable, very predictable, um, the summers. Um, regularly westerly breezes, daytime heat, almost no rain, relatively speaking, uh, in the summer. Average temperature is about 75 degrees. I'm talking Jerusalem here, okay, which is, yeah, very comfortable, you know, average temperature. Uh, uh, high temperature, 107, it can get hot in Jerusalem. It can get hot. Um, it's not typical, though. It's not typical. It can get hot. The daily wind, and this is related to your question, uh, uh, Dick, the daily wind off the sea produces a heavy dew in much of the land during the dry season. The moisture of that dew is sufficient to grow such crops as grapes, olives, pomegranates, figs, etc. during that season. And so there have to be harvests in the fall. So it's just from the dew. I mean, there's some opportunities because you're going to go up into the hills, the dew is going to drop, and it's going to allow the opportunity um, for and grow some of those crops. This is just a kind of little chart, the Jerusalem average temperature, uh, roughly speaking. So here in July, average temperature, you know, just over 80 um, degrees, which is very comfortable. Uh, it'll, uh, and then the low temperatures, you look up down here in you know, January, February, you can get, you know, you can, this is the average temperature. It can get actually colder. Um, and let's look at that winter. Uh, winter time, October through April, very similar to our winter. Uh, unstable, unpredictable. Lot Lots of storms. Um, it could be you have problems. There's increased rain, storms, wind, uh, early rains. Remember, we talk. You see in the scriptures, it talks about the early rains and the latter rains. Always didn't have latter rains, but if you had latter rains, that was great because that really helped you for your crops um, the next year. Uh, average temperature, 47. Ah, that's a little cool. Um, during the winter time uh, in Jerusalem, okay. Uh, low temperature, 26. What's 26? That's below freezing. Okay, which one is below freezing? What does that mean? It can snow. It can snow. I'll show you some pictures. Average rain. This is in Jerusalem, about 16 inches. So they can have um, some crops um, that are there. Because of the lay of the land, here's a, a key thing when you think. 
Rainfall tends to decrease as you go south, because you're heading toward the desert, east, because you're heading toward the desert, or down. So if it's a higher ele elevation, you have more rain. If it's north, you're going to have more rain. Israel, you look to the northern part of the country, up in Galilee, right? You're going to have more. It's going to be lusher, because there's going to be more rain um, up there. Okay? Here's some pictures of uh, snow. Yeah, this is Israel. This is right, kind of relatively close to um, Jerusalem. Now, this isn't, isn't common, but it does happen. Uh, I love this <laughs> This is one of those another mighty ministers. I love this. Second Samuel 23. There's another guy, Benaiah. I think uh, the uh, McGraw's name one of their sons after this guy. Uh, Benaiah, uh, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kazbael, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel Moab. What else did he do? I love this. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. All those details. Um, this guy's like, yeah, there's a lion down there. I want to do that. Yeah, I woke up today. I want to jump down in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. It just shows this, this guy didn't have any gun, right? He's just mono a mono, hand in combat. What happened in snow? That tells you there was snow. There's a couple of just pictures of, of the snow. This is, you know, Dome of the Rock here. Um, this is Jerusalem. Uh, uh, this is the Dome of the Rock um, up on the very top. Um, it's not typical, okay? It's not typical. There will be, you know, years that will go by. This won't happen. It doesn't happen every year at all, but you can't get snow um, uh, there. And then there's just a kind of a, a beautiful picture. Um, once again, uh, the uh, Dome of the Rock here and uh, the Alaska Mosque um, here. Uh, this is the Temple Mount. But you can see it's the snow in the middle of a, a, a snowstorm, okay? They can get um, snow. And next week, we'll look at Jerusalem, okay? Questions? Climate? It just remind us that all these things are inspired by God, right? God put his people in the middle of a, a location where the climate was very significant, where they had to depend on him for rain. If they don't trust him, aren't walking with him, then they're not going to experience rain. And they're going to, it's going to be very, very serious. Um, the whole... Um, the book of, uh, book of Ruth is set in this context, right? There's a great famine. What was famine caused by at this time? Lack of rain, typically. That's the cause of a famine because there's not water. The crops aren't going to grow, so they're going to have to go over to Moab. Um, that's where uh, uh, Ruth's husband, where they go, where her two sons are born, uh, goes over to Moab because there was going to be more rainfall um, in that particular area. It wasn't um, where she was located. Okay, well, next time uh, we will pick up on Jerusalem. Let me close our time in prayer. God, we bow before you. Thank you that you are sovereign over all things, not just then, but today. I pray that we would live in light of your sovereignty and rejoice because of what you've done for us and uh, that we could know you in your name. Amen.